Welcome back to another Human Humane Architecture Show here in the dusky downtown Honolulu, which is our metropolis that is a coastal mountainy metropolis that's very special. So Hawaiians call that uh, Makai Mauka. So in between the ocean and our, our real mountains, we have created an artificial mountainscape and that is one of the biggest skylines in the United States after New York, Chicago, LA, of course. So this show is dedicated to relentlessly research about architecture that is trying to be as good as nature is, and we won't give up on that. And last show we had a new piece of architecture by uh, Jim Kusakuma, his new rainbow drive in shoulders. So we're not going to go into another typology, into the high-rise typology, as you can tell. Um, the building we're actually sitting in. And our expert today is, is our, um, our, our hero of this new show because uh, he <laughs> had the most. For the last show we had about a couple weeks ago, you already had 220 clicks and three likes. So DeSoto Brown, Bishop Museum historian, welcome back. Thank you for having me. Nice to be here. And we have to say, immediately after the show, the last show, it poured out of us to say, we got to do another one. That's we right. have so many right. ideas. Right. So we, we choose this one here. We want to jump right in. We're going to talk, before we talk about the building, we're going to talk about the architect, so the creator okay. of the building, and All if right. we can get the first picture. So who, who is that guy? Well, you tell me, because actually I'm not that familiar. I do know that that's the Space Needle on the left, mm -hmm. which was created for the... Seattle World's Fair, mm -hmm. and which in 1962, which I went to, mm -hmm. and I got to go in the Space Needle. But uh, the Space Needle was the famous first. It was it was the one. It was the rotating restaurant that got the most publicity at that time. And if you ever watched the Jetsons cartoon show, I don't know if you did in mm -hmm. Germany, but you we did. did in the USA. Mm -hmm. The Space Needle was something that appeared a lot mm -hmm. in the backgrounds mm -hmm. of that show because it was the thing of the future and we were all going to be living in buildings like the Space Needle mm -hmm. at some point. Mm, it didn't quite happen that way. But <laughs> you tell us about the architect. And this is interesting because it's it's kind of you're you're forgiven for not, not remembering because if it would have been Frank Lloyd Wright, if it would have been Lou Kahn, we wouldn't have forgotten it. So right. it's and that's a good thing because it gets us to the first point. It wasn't what we would call today a boutique architect. No. Or, or an avant-garde architect. It was actually who many consider America's most commercial architect. And his name was John Graham. And John Graham is the architect of, of that particular building we're talking about. And he had actually prototyped the revolving rooftop flying saucer slash restaurant for the next year to become world famous. But it was prototyped in our you know, tropical metropolis of Honolulu. That's and right. that's little known and little remembered. Correct. And so we go maybe to the next uh, picture. Let's look at our next picture. That Let's shows us the urban fabric. And there's actually, the, we were just before the show talking about a picture I was trying to find and not, not finding or not, you know, wasn't successful. But here is actually, it's, it gets close to that because this is the building with a red arrow, obviously, so Correct. no one will overlook it. Correct. Now, I think the interesting thing is that, uh, as also we were talking about beforehand, the Ala Moana building, which is what we're talking about today, is part of the Ala Moana Shopping Center. And I believe, certainly at the time that this was constructed, let me, let me just back up a little bit. The Ala Moana Shopping Center, the first phase, opened in 1959. Soon after that was open, construction started on the Ala Moana building, the high-rise. I think it's very rare, and probably this could be one of the few occasions where a shopping center constructed a high-rise as part of the complex. Mm -hmm. Then in 1966, the second phase of Ala Moana opened, and so it became a shopping center that was horizontal with one vertical high-rise attached to it or as part of it. Mm -hmm. And that is pretty much, as I say, unique. And that picture perfectly portrays and that. And this picture is very cool because this is a mid-1960s postcard that shows the Ala Moana building on the left in the, in the distance. In the foreground on the right is part of a sculptural uh, fountain mm -hmm. that was built at one end of Ala Moana when it first opened in 1959. And it has this tile work on it. It's very typical of 1959. 
and it's interesting because it had a Hawaiian theme. There were Hawaiian names, Hawaiian phrases attached to this mm -hmm. fountain. So mm -hmm. it sort of had a historical, mythical basis mm -hmm. as part of, uh, to, to acknowledge, you know, that this is in the Hawaiian Islands mm -hmm. as part of Hawaiian culture. Mm -hmm. And mostly we have to say we're, we enjoy it so much to sort of jam the pictures. Some come from you, some come from me. This mm -hmm. picture we have to give credit to our friend uh, Don Hibbert. Ah, okay. Who, and there are right, lots of right. copies of this floating around right, on the right, internet, right. but he took a really high resolution picture of okay. the actual okay. postcard. So That's thank good. you, Don, for that. Thank you, Don, for and that. And if we right. go to the next picture that actually shows ah. uh, sort of the spectacle, the crown, so to speak, of that building under construction Correct. and its context in the back, right? Yeah, and so we can see very clearly here, and this is interesting because this is a helicopter photograph. So there were no drones wow. in 1960 and 61. So this picture was taken from a helicopter hired by the construction, you know, the company or the contractor. It shows the La Ronde restaurant under construction on the very top of the Ala Moana building. And by the way, that building is also called 1441 Kapilani because mm -hmm. I think that's its official name. And then in the background, you can see Diamond Head. Well, La Ronde was a rotating restaurant and the whole point was you had dinner or whatever for usually took an hour to turn around. There it is. And there it is. So that was your view of this beautiful vista. So La Ronde really was uh, something to go to because it was something to look at. I mean, mm -hmm. in lots of other places, I can't imagine you would have had the view. As you said, we've got a Mauka, Mauka view of the mountains. We've got a Makai view of the ocean. We've got a beautiful vista for this 360 degree view. And today, well, La Ronde is no longer functioning as a restaurant. It's still there, present, and uh, Martin got to go up there and view it. But you can see that today, Diamond Head is completely obscured mm -hmm. by high-rises. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the view now would be nothing like what it was mm -hmm. back in 1961. Mm -hmm. No, that picture, I had a chance to be up there. The gentleman to the right was my oldest son, Joey, and we had the chance to go up there. and. It's, it's almost unbelievable how you talk about the, the, the prime uh, sort of economics of real estate and how they have been exploding. And how can such a space basically be, be empty, can be abandoned? There is right. there's the reactivation of the little sibling of that, which is on Kalakaua Avenue, which is called the uh, top, of Waikiki. top of Waikiki. And that just got recently reanimated, reactivated, and it's a really a hot spot where people go. But for some odd reason, in, in this case here, and Laron, we have to go back. I mean, you, you grew up here, so you know this from your old childhood memories, which you will share also about the main part of the building later. But this, this was a location, this was an event. I mean, Talking yeah. Cool, that's why we, why we named the show the cool, and I actually should have said the coolest commercial <laughs> classic, yeah. because this yeah. was this was top notch. This was yeah. America at its best, Absolutely. right? As a total piece of artwork, right, right. And it's not only for local residents to go there, mm -hmm. but this is also at the time already a tourist destination. Yeah. So you've got a market of people who are from outside who are going to want to take this 360 yeah, degree yeah, view yeah. thing, uh -huh. as well as people who lived here and. Just as with everything, when it first opens up, you want to go see it. So, and, and number seven uh, proves that pretty because some celebrities obviously helped uh, to promote to promote that as well. So, number seven is that picture with yeah. that young gentleman, you know, <laughs> and he's in love, and they're they're up there. And you said before, you know, this was this was the space age. This yes. was going, you know, shooting people on the moon. You know, mm -hmm. some debated what we don't want to know these people. But this was this was the way to basically show excellence and and a culture that is superior and can do all these things. Right? And it's also to show that technology is there mm -hmm. and technology is capable of taking us to a greater, greater, brighter future. Mm -hmm. And at that time period, you have to remember, people were really believing technology was saving the world. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, it was. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of things that were improving. But at the time, 1960, we're just seeing like the future so bright we got to wear shades because mm -hmm. technology is saving mm -hmm. us and here's a rotating restaurant to prove mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you, you segued us into, into the other cool part of the building, uh, which is picture eight shows actually a construction right. picture here. So Correct. there's this plinth with these breeze blocks. I'm going right. to say hi to my, my friend and colleague Lance Walters, who's doing great work with the students to 
think about that tradition as well. I think he's has, is in touch with you guys as well to potentially, I mean, this is a whole different story and we probably should even get Lance here and talk about that. But, I, I think you should too. But what we want to talk about is actually sort of the, we call that traditionally, that's the plinth and we mm -hmm. talk about the shaft that's in the background and then we talk about the crown, which we have already, which is the flying saucer. Right. But if we get to the next picture, this picture was, was the raw structure, but something is happening here. What, what, what happens there? This is, again, part of technology. Here's technology saving us. The Ala Moana building had a very interesting exterior, which consisted of, and you will see in a, in a few minutes what we're talking about, vertical louvers, which moved according to the position of the sun. So in this photograph on the left, you can see those louvers have already been installed, actually on the right too, but they're open, they're in a different position. So this is the louver system in, as it's being created. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And next picture, please, we see actually the louvers, how they are being brought on side, so you can see them on the right there. Right. They even have these sort of fin-shaped, you know, uh, ellip elliptical right. kind, of, kind of profile, very much like uh, airspace technology, yes. airspace thinking. You Correct. Know. This, Correct. Is this is high tech, right? Right. And they were mounted vertically, so you're seeing them lying down horizontally, but on the exterior, when they were in use, they were vertical, mm -hmm. mounted at the top and the bottom, and they could pivot and turn in whatever direction was necessary. And the next picture actually demonstrates that. I, I took that, I noticed that first when you had worked and, and helped here, uh, when the, the mall got expanded, there was an obligation to sort of mm -hmm. um, keep the memory intact, and there was an exhibit we just saw uh, the principal of the firm of Mason Architects walking by when we were preparing for the show outside. So Mason Architects were doing this construction fence exhibit that totally froze me. I mean, I, I just wanted to go to Long's and buy something, and I just got totally paralyzed in front of these boards and was soaking them up and was thinking, oh my God, <laughs> what little did I know? Because the building now, we have to say, um, so the building was, maybe at the end of the show, people agree, it was the coolest building. It is not anymore, but our pitch will be, it could be again. Correct. The reason why it's currently not anymore is that somewhere in the early 90s, facility manager, and this is me guesstimating, mm -hmm. and maybe I'm wrong and I'll let myself be corrected, but people came and said, well, this is technology and you always get a grease and oil and get it maintained. So this is sort of maybe too much pain in the butt. Why would we take these things off and we just beef up air, air conditioning in the building? Right. And then, and this is my other guess, that, and I have, you know, my dentist, as 20% of the island's dentist population is in the building. You said your dentist as well, right? They, he actually told me that the architect, the record of the renovation, wasn't quite sure himself about uh, what they did instead. What they did instead is a little whimsical horizontal louvers that everyone in architectural environmental um, classes 101 understands something that's not even a foot deep, uh, doesn't even work to the south. Uh, that's why our hats, our caps, you know, the lid is significantly longer proportionally than our face. If you do this to the west or the east, it doesn't work at all. So this is just the decoration, so the building wouldn't look like too naked, right? right. I was just going to say that the, the original louvers actually were functional, and I think what's on there now is just decoration, so it's not just a plain block. And mm -hmm. this is, uh, the picture we're looking at right now is an a artist's view of the building, not necessarily its accurate uh, appearance, but it does give you a feeling of what the mm -hmm. building looked like. Mm -hmm. and. Those louvers, you know, as you said, they're no longer in use. I am sure that they deteriorated in various ways. The mechanism to keep them running probably gave out. And rather than trying to redo this entire exterior of the building mm -hmm. with new louvers, they said, let's just take it all off. And also, too, we were talking about it, quote, modernizes the building. Mm -hmm. You take off that original 1960 exterior and you have a building that looks more up to date, and if you are looking for tenants, that's something that's a benefit for a lot of tenants. Oh yeah, look how modern it is, and it's all cleaned up and everything. Okay, we're going to take a short break all and right. then continue that exciting story about the coolest commercial classic in Honolulu. See you in a minute. Aloha, my name is Richard Emery, host of Condo Insider. More than a third of Hawaii's population live in some form of association, and our show is all about educating board members and owners about the responsibilities and obligations and providing solutions for a great association. 
You can watch me live on Thursdays, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. each week. Aloha. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage, which is on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock here on Think Tech. On Center Stage, I talk with artists about not only what they do and how they do it, but the meat of the conversation for me is why they do it, why we go through this. A lot of us are not making our livings doing this, and a lot of us would do this with our last dying breath if we had that choice. And that's what I love to talk to people about. I hope you enjoy watching it, and I hope you get inspired because there's an artist inside you too. Join us on Center Stage at 2 o'clock on Wednesdays. Bye. So we're back to Honolulu's coolest commercial classic here with the Soda Brown from the Bishop. Do you mean I'm the coolest always, commercial classic? Always, always, always. All right, all right. <laughs> okay, me in the building we're talking about. And you, yes. haven't, you haven't been stripped naked, luckily, as the project we're talking about. My louvers about didn't, are right. still functional. <laughs> very, very good, very <laughs> good. So let's, let's talk about what's so fantastic. Let's go back to that picture 12, please because what we see, again, is this sort of uh, illusion of the building or this sort of um, aspiration, what the building mm -hmm. wanted to show. But actually, if you would have looked at the building from the other angle, it would have looked slightly different. Why is that? Well, as you pointed out, the louvers were different, uh, had different colors on different surfaces. Mm -hmm. So one side was a more gold color, the other side was a more plain aluminum mm -hmm. color, mm -hmm. so that as those uh, louvers would have shifted, you would have seen a different mm -hmm. appearance to the building. And again, how many other buildings have that? Exactly. They don't. They don't. So if we go to picture 13, which we'll only show for a fraction of a second because it's so blurred, and I had to zoom in of another historic picture. But I allow myself to say, you know, the goal of the, the show to look for what's the closest to nature and architecture that building might have actually been. And in an interesting way, um, it never wanted to look like nature because nature is nature and architecture is architecture. But it was sort of understanding the principles of nature, of being bioclimatic, that shade is a characteristic, is a survival tool here in, in the tropics. And so it employed these, these mechanisms in, in a very high tech, in a very sort of, uh, you know, space agey, Jetsons kind of a way. Right. But if you look at that palm leaf and the texture of it and at the louvers, and both are not static, both are dynamic. Right. The wind makes the palm uh, leaf swing and, and the operation, the bioclimatic operation, made that building change its perception. Right, and please right. change that experience, that childhood experience when you saw your well, dentist in there. Well, right, and I was, I was at the dentist, and I was probably about eight years old or something, mm -hmm. and uh, I saw the louvers actually moving and was quite mystified as to what, what is going on. Because I'm sure there had been publicity about it, but as a little kid, I didn't get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And so to see these tall vertical things in front of the window start to move mm -hmm. was really mystifying mm -hmm. as to, why are they doing it? Mm -hmm. And as an adult, I do understand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so here they are. And I think the same is like nature. We don't completely sort of scientifically or logically understand, you know, we're not, unless we're biologists, you know, we understand how everything, everything works. But otherwise, we're, we're puzzled by nature in, in, a, in a positive way, right? It just, it just touches us because of its perfection of performance. So it isn't form per se of form. And it isn't uh, performing per se of performing. It's it's a blend of the two. Correct. Right? Correct. And now here, this is the thing that you were talking about earlier. That there is a way, and this is a modern version of the same system that mm -hmm. the Alamoana building mm -hmm. originally had. And uh, this is in England, I believe, Britain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here are the same louvers, and they can turn and they can pivot. But it's probably today this same system could be done in a more uh, reasonable fashion yes. that would probably be longer lasting, possibly use less electricity, etc. Mm -hmm. And if they could do this in England, which doesn't have a heat problem, mm -hmm. I've been there, mm -hmm. I know it doesn't yeah. have a heat problem, yeah. Yeah. that um, certainly this could be done in the Hawaiian Islands as well. And it isn't just something to do because it's kind of quirky and fun. It actually has a function. Yeah. Yeah. So it isn't just decoration as we were talking about. Yeah. This actually does help the building function and it helps mm -hmm. it be more functional mm -hmm. for the people in it. So we're making a case or a pitch to sort of reverse the, the process, basically bring back, and I made some really, this is far out there and I'm stretching myself and especially regarding the Bishop Museum integrant, um, background, I really want to be careful, but I compare the, the building's gesture to a feather cape that's a very mm -hmm 
thing very known to the culture here, right? Well, absolutely. But the point that you made, which I think is very true, if we get beyond the cape itself, but we talk about the bird that has the feathers, mm -hmm. you made up the point that, that uh, birds cool themselves off by putting up their wings or fluffing up their feathers, because mm -hmm. they can do that. Mm -hmm. If necessary, they can also put their feathers down to mm -hmm. be more sleek and aerodynamic. Mm -hmm. So while the Alamoana building was certainly not intentionally looking like a feather cloak or a bird, it still was using natural types of reactions for heating, cooling, etc. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a really good point, because it's true, there is a natural component to this, and there is a natural analogy mm -hmm. to it. And you made a great point, too, before the show that you said, well, mid-century-wise, everyone was taken away by the beauty of our islands, but they, they did not try to even compete or compare themselves to nature. They were actually saying, well, we're, we're leading the world, and we can do stuff that's so stunning architecturally that it sort of naturally will sort of blend in and will be sort of equal to right. the it, performance it, it, of it, nature. It's a spectacle of itself. Mm -hmm. In other words, we've got the mountains and the ocean, as you just said, mm -hmm. we've got the sky, we've got clouds, but we also can build buildings that are of themselves are eye-catching. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's true, and I think that this building was like that. I think mm -hmm. that that was one mm -hmm. of the intentions. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's very true about this, well, we've got one more innovation to talk about, but after that, we can focus on how this building really was yeah, iconic yeah, yeah. in its time. Okay, Lynn, let's get this out of the way because this picture here is basically, this is me, the practicing architect, kicking in and having worked for commercial clients and working for them. So if Martin wants to go up and, and today sell to a client to make a facade, a building envelope, and another facade over it, good luck, Martin, because we live in a highly capitalized way. And unfortunately, that spirit of you know, doing more uh, for uh, symbiosis of reasons is unfortunately gone, let's face it. But we can maybe still smuggle it in if, if we add a performative aspect. And the aspect is if by nature, if a louver is shading, it's exposed to the sun. So if we take that long side of the louver and equip it with uh, modern photovoltaic technology, which is, which is thin film PV that you can code on, by the same time the building is reducing energy by being self-shaded so it doesn't overheat, the rest of energy it needs for you know, lights and computers, and maybe that little bit AC, you can harvest yourself. So we're saying we're, we're taking this building that has sort of collective memory in the city and we're boosting it into the future because we're saying the nature of these clients, they want cool, and they only want the bioclimatic cool if it's pop culturally cool. That's Correct. our point. That, right? That's right. But, but again, the technology, we were just saying, technology was seen as the savior of things. Mm -hmm. Here's a situation where it may not save us, but it certainly is going to enhance yeah, things. Yeah. It's going to make things better. Mm -hmm. So being able to generate your own electricity through an architectural uh, element mm -hmm. is uh, winning in both situations. And which is integrative to the system. So we're having to step aside a little bit about my local Momo membership and you being the historian where we would love to bring things back exactly the way they were. Okay. But maybe if that is impossible, we got to compromise if it's in an integrative way and not in a sort of attached way. Correct. And, and even if it even if it isn't this particular building, yeah. which we in wish it was, yeah. mm -hmm. it's still something that we can look mm -hmm. forward to. Mm -hmm. It's something that uh, is useful and it looks interesting. And as a motivation, let's use the rest of the show to bring a little bit back that collective memory we were all talking right. about. So all right, the next all right, picture, all right. Okay. Where's that from? Okay. Well, this is from the film Blue Hawaii in 1961, and it's a kind of a distortion distorted picture, but because Elvis, I took it that way, because sorry. you took it that way on the TV screen. <laughs> but Elvis Presley is talking to his girlfriend Joan Blackman, and down in the right-hand corner, they're they're supposedly having a picnic on Tantalus. Down in the right-hand corner, you can see the Ala Moana building, which at the time was in the midst of a long, large, flat, open area. Mm -hmm. So it really stood out. So anytime anybody took a picture or a film of Honolulu, there was that building right there prominently, and. Interestingly, this scene is where Elvis is saying he's going to become a tour guide mm -hmm. because tourism is booming so much. Well, that was a true that was mm -hmm. true for that mm -hmm. time period. Mm -hmm. So, as he's talking in the background is one of the symbols of this economic growth. Amazing. Next year, another Elvis movie came out that was a little reactionary, mm -hmm. and that is this one here. Yeah, and this is a film called Girls, Girls, Girls. Now, interestingly, this film is set in sort of a mythical, unidentified location. 
because he had just been in Blue Hawaii, they didn't want to put him in another Hawaii-based mm -hmm. film. So they never really specify where this place supposedly is that he's a boat captain. But in this scene right here, you can clearly see there's our Ala Moana building in the background. We caught them on that one. We oh did yeah, this, we, we did. did snapshot oh, yeah, we because did. they weren't intending to show that, and it goes by so fast, so they don't. They didn't want that. Yeah, but we see it anyway. And and where else in pop culture? <laughs> <laughs> and there is Thomas Magnum, star of the television series Magnum PI, which replaced Hawaii Five O as in the 1980s as the most popular Hawaii-based TV series. And in the background, again, there's our Ala Moana building because you couldn't escape it when you were filming or photographing. They and didn't want to. They didn't want to. There was no need the to. But um, also, too, uh, in the opening sequence of the original Hawaii Five O series, there are two, one or two shots that are very difficult to identify, but it's a very quick zoom towards the blue neon that was around mm -hmm. the edge of La Ronde. Mm -hmm. So in addition to Magnum, who we just saw, you mm -hmm. can also see a little bit of La Ronde in the opening of Hawaii mm -hmm. Five-O. Mm -hmm. So there's our iconic building. Perfect. Right there. Speaking of iconic building, we have a minute left for the show. There's one building that could motivate us for our case. And so if you can bring up number 19, this is the building that could, are. could be a motivation, right? There it is. Because that has been transitioned from almost being demolished and then right. thanks to Dean Sakamoto and then others, having told Howard Hughes this is a prime piece that you want to keep and you can use it to your advantage to promote, right? Right. And they did, and they did, and they put their, they put their showroom in there. Mm -hmm. And th a lot of the ground floor is this very high-end Howard Hughes Corporation showroom mm -hmm. of here are the buildings mm -hmm. we're going to be building. Mm -hmm. And I'm very grateful it got kept. Mm -hmm. And I think it looks, and it looks fabulous. Yeah, it yeah. looks great. So that being said, the last picture is going to be our, our final pitch picture to General Growth Properties, who is the yeah. owner of the building. Okay. And our proposition is just, just bring back La Ronde. Right. You know, it's not rocket science. That thing must have been running on an electric, you know, there wasn't, you know, more high tech technology wasn't around. So it was always low tech, so that's easy to bring back. Right? Correct. And again, it would be, it always was a unique, wonderful experience. It was something that people enjoyed. If it was possible, I tell you, I'd go back there. Mm -hmm. And they may not have a round menu the way they did in the original, but why not, you know? Awesome. It's a round building, a round menu. Exactly. With that, so we're going to bring it back. Thank All you right. very much for okay. having been here. We All have right. already lined up a couple of new shows, <laughs> so be excited about that. Thank you very much. To You're welcome. You're welcome. An awesome show. So see you back uh, next Tuesday, early evenings, for another round of Human Humane Architect.